Three, two, one. Peace, everyone. Welcome to Podcast Noor, a podcast of guided storytelling sessions where storytellers come to share their story for the first time or the right time. I'm your guide, Noor, and today's storyteller is Jenna Wortham. Jenna Wortham is the kind of person who sees your insides before you even might. She has a finger on the pulse of culture and our needs. Jenna is a writer at New York Times Magazine, co-author alongside the brilliant Kimberly Drew of the anthology Black Futures, and co-host of the New York Times award-winning podcast Still Processing, where her and her best friend, the Times critic at large, Wesley Morris, make listeners feel like they're eavesdropping on two best friends talking about exactly what we need to be discussing in culture. Anywhere from the use of the N-word to posing the question, does this phone make me look human while discussing how COVID has impacted our need for our devices to critiquing some of the latest shows, albums, and more. One of my favorite things about Jenna is their healing spirit. They are a sound healer, Reiki practitioner, herbalist, and community care worker oriented toward healing justice and liberation. Jenna is from the DMV. For those of you who don't know, the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. That's where I'm from, so that might be why I have even more love for them. In this episode, we are talking about our own biases we carry, the state of journalism, being told you are a, quote, diversity hire, unquote, healing, how she made her way up in the New York Times, and the process of building the anthology Black Futures. Before we get started, I encourage you to set an intention for these conversations. It's a great way to let your brain know you want it to actively do something great and focused just for you. My intention for this storytelling session is to learn from a journalist who is currently working in a traditional medium and how to incorporate healing in your stories and in your life. Now let's get started. so happy that you're here oh me too you're also just like a bright ray of sunshine (laughs) like you this is a great um face to meet with at 8 a.m on a monday morning it's perfect honestly i'm so happy you agreed to doing 8 a.m because i wake up really really early and if i could do like all of my work between the hours of 4 and 10 a.m i'd be happy whoa wait so can you tell me about your morning routine because i i am an early morning person but i'm not an early morning productive person my morning routine is i wake up and no matter how early i wake up i still like hit snooze a bunch of times i'm gonna say on like the best of days this is on the best of days but i'll hopefully get out of bed by like 4 15 4 30 and then i will read my morning prayers and mm-hmm. then I will do my morning pages and okay do you, do you know what morning pages are I do I do okay great so freehand write three pages no matter what lately a lot of poetry has been coming out from it so I've been really oh excited God. that's incredible yeah and then after morning pages I will prep for any of the interviews I have that day. Mm -hmm. I do really well with prepping for interviews really early so that there's no noise. And it's kind of extreme of consciousness. I really like tap into what am I curious about? What do I know? What do I not know? Mm -hmm. And then I do ARMY. So ARMY is like a, it was a boutique, is slash was a boutique studio in New York. And now they have all of their classes online. So I do cycle or I'll do a boot camp, but their mm-hmm. cycles really, I mean, all of it is really amazing because it's also, um, it's like mental coaching and not just physical coaching, which is what I need more sometimes because that helps me push through the mental or the physical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I do a polar plunge in our pond, but right now it's frozen. Okay, I have to talk to you about the polar plunge. I read that you do that, and I was obsessed. So <laughs> I, I've only tried that once 
when I was doing my sound teacher training, we were we were studying right next to this river, and every morning the teacher was obsessed with getting everybody in the water, and I only did it once. But so talk to me about doing it every day and like what comes up for you and and why. That's wow, like. it's medicine. I yeah. mean, every single morning I'll go out and see if I can. Today it was frozen, okay, which is unfortunate because yesterday was such a beautiful day, but overnight it was really cold, and it's okay. a huge swimming quarry. Like it's it's really oh big, God. and there's waterfalls. It's amazing. I'm looking at it right now. It's right there. Oh, and so we have liter- like, th- this is how badly Adam and I need it. We will crack the ice if we yes. need to, to just get into like a small place. And it's, I guess it started because I was too nervous to jump into the pond in general over the mm-hmm. summertime because I've never swam in a pond before. And my friend, Sophia, she encouraged me to, so we held hands and we jumped off like the little cliff and we jumped into the water and I was freaking out and it was so, it was just like a really healing, I don't know, the spirit of that pond is something that, it it just feels like medicine. Mm -hmm. So, and then I just get, I had to keep doing it. I looked up a lot of Wim Hof's breathing techniques because he talks a lot about cold therapy. And now every morning when we jump into it, It's like once you're in, because I always say taking cold showers is harder than doing the plunge because it's like the water. I did a cold shower this morning because I couldn't. And it's like the water is hitting you. So your body is warm, (laughs) but some of it's cold. It's just not the best situation. But when you jump in, the only thing that you feel is survival. And that's why it's so healing because to me, it's the only thing that gets me to a place where nothing else is on my mind. Mm. And once you feel that, I mean, we have been trying to extend our time in it because technically you're supposed to be in it for like three minutes, Mm -hmm. but our pond right now is melted frozen water. So Mm -hmm. it is colder than it has ever been. So it's been painful, but 100% worth it. Afterwards, you almost don't even want to shower because you're Mm -hmm. like, I don't want to rinse this feeling that like my internal body has gotten to so you know we're a couple wow. hours away from the city so if you ever want to come up we have a guest cabin and you can totally do oh. polar plunges it's it's kind of like the christening for anybody who comes to visit us kind of have to jump in <laughs> wow I will probably take you up on that that's amazing I think that's incredible I do remember feeling that feeling of like um just clarity like it just felt mm-hmm. so it just cut through whatever I don't know, like whatever. I I mean, I didn't have brain fog up there, but I just, I remember just feeling so clear after. Yeah. And really alive and how just miraculous. Like I remember just feeling like it is a miracle that I have a body, that I am conscious, I'm sentient. You know, I just felt so grateful. So I know what you're saying, but that's amazing. You get to do that every day. Almost every day. I mean, hopefully soon every day. I'm yeah. so grateful for it. I actually wrote about it in my journal today, just how grateful I am because I, I really believe it's medicine. I think cold therapy is medicine. Even one of the verses in the Quran, which is like the holy book for Muslims, if you mm-hmm. listeners don't know, mm-hmm. there's a verse that literally says, it talks about one of the prophets um, having just like mental anguish and God telling him to go into cold water. Mm. And... I, I had to use that to family members who are skeptical because I'm just like, listen, I get that you think that I'm all like, Woo-hoo, but it's right like, there. It's right here. So yeah. let's do it. That's great. I mean, I think a lot of people do a lot of spiritual bypassing in general and take, I mean, this is not the direction I thought our conversation was going to go, but like religion in general being just about like rules and restrictions and I'm just like, you have to look for the, like, you have to look for the love in it. You have to, you have to teach people religion through the lens of love and healing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and just belief in general. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've never heard that term spiritual bypassing, but it's, it's resonating a lot. Um, mm. I'll tell you what it means. Mm-hmm. So hopefully it resonates a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I learned it from a teacher of mine. Do you come from a family that practices any religion? No, my my family's pretty atheist and growing up my two best friends they they were deeply religious. 
um, black Southern Christian families and uh, one was Seventh-day Adventist and one was a bit more Baptist. And so in order to spend time with them, I, you know, I was spending the nights, at, you know, on the weekends at their houses, I had to go to church. And so I, you know, I just, I grew up in, in this really interesting way where my parents were just like, whose child are you? Like, what is this? At the same time, you know, I really, I really appreciated the sense of community, the sense of camaraderie. I, I, I really appreciated what people were reaching towards, even though it wasn't necessarily, it didn't become my, my practice or my religion, but I did find, you know, the synchronous, the, the choreography and the synchronicity of it mm. to be really, really beautiful and enchanting. And I've been remembering, um, but I want to hear about spiritual bias passing, but I'll, I'll just say really quickly, I, I've been re-remembering things from my childhood lately. And I was thinking a lot of, I have to call my former childhood best friend and corroborate this with her. Um, but we're still close, so I know that this won't even come. Like, I can just text her and be like, girl, do you remember this time? Um, but um, I, I have this memory of driving through the night in Virginia to go to this tent and, like, an all-night revival. Like, I remember this really intense, you know, intoxication and just this really intense ceremony and witnessing it and not really understanding what was going on, but just feeling like I'm at the precipice of something so incredible. But I do remember they kept saying, you know, does anybody here want to be saved tonight? And my, my best friend's mom kept like nudging me up and I was like, I'm good. You know, even at like nine, I knew myself well enough to know like, you know, maybe one day, but not, today's not the day. And I, I never wanted, you know, I was never susceptible enough to be talked into something that wasn't quite right for me. But I remember she was on a mission. Like, I think she really thought I was a heathen and she really, oh, you know, I, I really needed Jesus. And I was like, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> like, I remember that so clearly. Did you ever tell your parents about that moment? I didn't. You know, I didn't. Um, but they were curious. I remember they were so curious about what I was getting out of these services, you know, and I think I was I was pretty young, so I wasn't really absorbing much of it. But I remember even having enough of a mind to I would hear, you know, I might hear the pastor say something and be like, I don't really agree with that. And either like talk about it with the kids my age, or I would just be like processing it in my mind. But, but some parts that resonated most deeply, and I think this is kind of what you're, you're getting at, when, was when they would talk about, you know, what to do for the person sitting right next to you. And I could see that there was this deep sense of, you know, care and concern. And, and one of the churches I went to was Caribbean Seventh-day Adventist, and that was really steeped in you know, we would go to the service and then we'd go to someone's house for the repast. And there was a lot of like making sure everybody that came left with food, right? Making sure mm -hmm. what are your plans for the winter? Do you have enough warm clothing? And I think what was really, what I took away mostly from those experiences was, you know, kind of sharpening my own sense of non-judgment, right? Because this wasn't for me, but I didn't feel... I didn't feel any type of way about it, the people who it clearly was for. But I, I remember feeling like this is how you, like this is important. This is how you show up for community. Like you kind of make sure people are good. Because you're seeing people mm -hmm. every week and you're kind of clocking the small changes. Like, okay, this family is not looking as pulled together. These kids don't seem like they have gloves. Like, you know, and, and really just like, kind of making sure there's enough distribution and, and not like singling anybody out. So those are the memories that I, that, that, that I really absorb the most, but no, my parents were like, what the hell are you doing? You know, they were really like, especially my father, he was just like, what is this? I think it's awesome that they let you go on your journey and your path to figure it out for yourself. I really like, I'm a big believer in figuring out what you believe for yourself mm -hmm. and you know, being given knowledge, but also just the love in your heart, knowing that you are loved and you're here for a reason. And even mm -hmm. what you were just saying is what you should be getting out of faith. Mm -hmm. Spiritual bypassing is using faith and religion t to suppress what you actually have to deal with. So if someone is going through depression blaming it on them not being close enough to God and asking them to pray it away, which is oftentimes what happens in faith communities when people mm -hmm. are dealing with mental health 
problems or any life problem that people don't want to directly take head on, it's oftentimes met with that. And that's spiritual bypassing. Got it. Wow. 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 Thank you for sharing that. I'm so happy that we got to talk about that at the very beginning. (laughs) I didn't even get to ask you the first question I ask everybody, which is, Uh how is your heart doing today? Oh, that's a really, really beautiful question. My heart is so full today. I'm a little raspy because I I am, as you know, I'm half vaccinated and just such a relief feeling. Oh my God. And I um, got to visit with Wesley, who I make my work, um, my New York Times podcast with. We're in a pod together and we have, we've been, we've gotten so much closer during this whole situation this last year or so. And every now and again, we'll have indoor dinners, we'll isolate and get tested and have indoor dinners. And so we had one last night. And I think we used to have dinner all the time and I would just pop over, he would come over and we both love to cook and we love to cook for each other. And, but I think in the pandemic, because we're not doing them as often, there'll be these like, like I was over there for like six hours and we're just talking the whole time. And, you know, it's just so fun. Like we're, like I'm bringing him snacks. We're trying different things. He's got like all my favorite seltzers and like I'm just in my vibe, you know? And so I just think I've really come to appreciate intimacy these days because it's just so rare that you get to have intimacy intimacy outside of your, your I guess, you know, inner life because it's so hard to connect with people in that way right now. Um, so I just feel, I've just come to realize how precious my friendships are and you know, I really feel reflected in that friendship and mirrored and supported and held and delighted. Like, I feel like we are so delighted by each other. And I was just reading this quote that was like, make sure you have people in your life that are delighted by you. And that that's a way to like tend to your innermost self too, because those feelings do take you back to childhood and they do, they do, they do something different inside of your body and your brain when you, you know that someone you adore is just getting such a kick out of you. And we just really get a kick out of each other. And so we were kind of working, but we were also just cycling through like so many life questions. And then there's always a point in the night when I just start going through Wesley's stuff. Like I love, you know, he has (laughs) such great taste. Like I love his clothes, you know, I love his books. I love all the things in his house. And so I just start rifling through everything and like bringing things out. And I'm like, what's this, you know? (laughs) He showed me this book last night that it was so funny. We did this thing that I think is also very black where I'm like, I got to go home. And then I put my coat on and I'm, I like to go to bed early too. Cause I like to wake up early in the morning and it was like 10 and I was like, I'm so tired. I have to leave. But we're, I was standing in the door. We were still talking. And, um, he was showing me this book. Oh my God, no, we were crying. He bought this book <laughs> online and he was like, I thought it was an Ida B. Wells <clears throat> book. And he's like, I thought this was an official Ida B. Wells book, but he's like, there's nothing in it. And it was like. It literally looked like it had been photocopied by like a child and like bound together. And he was like, what is this book, Jenna? Like who, what is the province of this book? I don't know where this book came from. I think it may be cursed or it has some incredible thing inside of it you need to see. But so my heart feels really full because it's just such a gift. And, you know, I I didn't take it for granted before, but I, I have such a deep appreciation for my friends and the connections in my life now. And so I'm just like... I feel so loved and I feel so belonged, you know? Mm. Wow. Well, that story just made my heart so full. Would you say that you and Wesley have better conversations off the podcast than on them? (laughs) They're definitely more R-rated offline. um, (laughs) Because we really do just talk about everything. But I think they're more all over the place because my my brain, well, his brain too is really, um, we both have galaxy brain all the time. And I always say when I feel most comfortable, it's like a filing cabinet in an anti-gravity room. It's just like things are just kind of flowing and free associating. And I, when I really feel in trust and when I really feel in love, like I can just really just speak on like wherever my mind is going. And so I think they're more free ranging, but I think, you know, the pod is personal, but, and I I think in the past we did talk more about our relationships and like the life changes. I mean, we've been doing this for five or six years. And so we both have reached really different periods, um, in our lives over in the, you know, our lives have changed. We've gotten much older over the course of making the show. And I think we're just having different 
kinds of conversations and we we talk more about our families. I mean, this is something I want to hear how your heart is today, actually, as well. But I also want to talk to you about, you know, like the boundary between personal and private, because I'm, I find that I draw it very instinctually, you know, like mm-hmm. they're just some things that are for me, you know, and are for him, I would say. Um, but just speaking for myself, like I, I, I do think that we have fuller conversations offline because we're going in deep about our families and relationships, dreams, desires, but those aren't necessarily the things that our listeners need to consume or, or get to. Hmm. I mean, I love hearing more of the personal. I think a really good storyteller also shares personal and makes people feel like they know everything about you, but it's only a tiny fraction. Like by the time you're sharing something that's personal, hopefully, I mean, the show is still processing, but hopefully it is processed or hopefully it's towards the end of being processed and you're not talking about something that you're going through at the very beginning of it because that that's when it's, the most vulnerable. I, I mean, at least for me, I draw that boundary very instinctively. I actually wrote a whole piece about that. I didn't share it or anything, but I wrote this for myself a couple of days ago because I was trying to figure out like why, why it's so hard for me to share certain things or I, what was it actually? It was a really good piece. All I see in my journal right now is society punishes people who don't drink. <laughs> Whoa, I want to talk about that too. Cause I, I agree. Oh, oh I, I wrote, agree. okay. I wrote, I hate taking myself too seriously on the internet. Tracing back, I realized it's because I never felt like I had room or space to be more myself in that way online. Mm-hmm. You're so graceful. You're so elegant. You're so eloquent. Really kind words I'm grateful for, but I just want to be more me. And then I wrote this mm-hmm. story about how during London Fashion Week last year, I really wanted to wear this casual more street style outfit. It was like scrunchy jeans, a bomber jacket. It was really bright. But the designers, people was like, "Mm, we really thought you could wear something more elegant. So they gave me like a silk skirt and a button up. And I was like, but I really wanted to wear this. And then it kind of, it was devastating. (laughs) So then I wrote this whole list of things that people don't know about me on the internet. And then I ended it and realized like maybe if I like, Maybe the reason that I do this is because some of it is just for me, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, which is like a really, uh, it's a complicated line to, to balance because yes, you share, like, yes, you set those boundaries intuitively and you know what you can trust, what you can put out, what you're ready to do. The more and more we do this, the more I realize, like, I really want a game plan to get off of the internet. Like, I really want to figure out a way to get off and still figure out how to service my community. I don't Mm -hmm. know if that's through email and newsletters or texting or whatever it is, but it's really hard to pursue opening up more and more when the apps or the outlets want you to serve an algorithm and not people. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I realized like the more that I write and the more personal that I get, the more people aren't seeing that and the more pe- the people I want to see it aren't seeing it. But if you post like something that matches what Instagram or Facebook or Twitter wants you to write about, or wants you to post, it works. And so I'm just like, how can I bring my people to a place where I like they can get the stuff that I know that they need right now or that I want to share with them without compromising? So that's mm-hmm. the dance I'm playing right now. What about you? Mm, that's so interesting. I, I really identify with so much your your sharing. So thank you for speaking so freely. Um, I, this is one. Of, this is something I love thinking about. And I was just reading. Um, I was looking around for it. I don't know where I put it. My copy. What you can see is like, you know, this is where I, I work. I've moved my desk into this front room because I get beautiful light in the morning. But like, they're just stacks and stacks of books like, <laughs> right outside of your view. Um, I was just reading. No one is talking about this. Patricia Lockwood's book where she's, it's a lightly fictionalized, I, th- I mean, it's a fiction book, but she, it's, she's drawing from some elements of her life. And it's, um, she's a poet who became, um, you know, very, like many people, I mean, you know, she went viral at some point and um, for this poem she wrote about sexual assault. And in the book, 
the narrator is a poet who becomes famous for a tweet that's like, can a dog be twins? And everybody loves it. And she's like, kids won't know like the Gettysburg Address, not that they need to, but like they know can a dog be twins. And she's like grappling with this responsibility and this power and like her addiction. And then something happens halfway through the book and and her worldview shifts um, and her priorities change. And I really enjoyed reading it because I don't know that anyone has really captured or tried to capture um, the intoxicating way you get really drawn into social media and, and, and how unbelievable it is to all of a sudden have thousands, hundreds of thousands in your case, you know, people listening to you and, and being curious about what you have to say and how um, incredible that is, right? And I think, you know, Patricia Lockwood is a cishet white woman. I think that there's a very specific perspective, right, about what it means to have that much attention. But I also think for folks who are not part of the dominant culture in this country, you know, these, the internet is oftentimes the only way we've had access to read about things that are interesting to us, read about other people's stories, like, you know, so, so we're kind of caught in this really interesting dance. But what you said I'm really thinking about is, you know, you know, being, we, we make these personas, we create and we craft these personas to, um, you know, build up ourselves and, and they, they do attract attention and that becomes the thing people know you as or know you for. And then when you try to shift it, it's really hard. And I think, I, I find that to be really interesting. Like, why isn't it possible to be a chameleon and be chimeric online? I mean, that's, it, it should be, it shouldn't be stagnant, you know, it should be dynamic. And so it's really interesting to think about kind of how we get boxed in. And I, I used to feel that way where like, I really wanted, when I was younger, um, because I've been a, a reporter for the Times for so long, and so I've always felt like I had to mind my P's and Q's online. And uh, I remember feeling really jealous at some point, like, wow, I just want to while out. I want to act crazy online, you know? And <clears throat> and then I had to ask myself, but who is that for? And, and, and why do I want that version of myself online? And what would that ultimately mean? And I think it, it was hard. And I, I really felt like, but I just want to, I want to just yeah, I don't want to be this buttoned up version of myself. And ultimately I had to learn that, yeah, it's tough because the internet, I just wanted to have fun, right? And I had to learn ultimately, like this isn't the place for that as hard as, you know, as, as unfortunate <laughs> as that is, like this is just not the place for that for me, for better or for worse. And I made peace with it. And I think it does allow a lot of separation now. I think I'm... I'm lucky in that, you know, I've stayed working at the times. Like I haven't really needed to use Instagram to promote myself or generate work in that way, which I feel a lot of gratitude for. And I'm also at a place where I'm sort of ready to stop feeding the fish, you know, and I, I think I enjoy, I really enjoy seeing what's going on, but I'm more aware as time goes on what's happening in my brain every time I open one of these apps. And I think I just, I feel like adrenaline spiking, you know, I feel myself getting kind of worked up. I feel myself, you know, trying to figure out, like there's this great part in, nobody's talking about this where, you know, it's like <laughs> the narrator is like, my head is hurting. It's because of my new class consciousness, you know, and it's just really funny. It's like this great meditation on like how every time you access social media, you just kind of feel humbled and a little bit ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> at the same time and I don't know how useful that is you know as a as a, as a mechanism even though mm. I'm grateful because there's just so much there's so much perspective and so much knowledge and I was even reading a friend's post last night that was really incredible and articulated things I've been thinking about about the you know inequity in the vaccine distribution and I I couldn't figure out if I wanted to say something if I you know needed to say something about it and I was so grateful that someone else had, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Because it, I was like, yes, this is exactly what, like, I was like, oh, I want to talk to you about this. But I also, yeah, I struggle with that as well. Like, what is, what is the point? Like, what is the purpose? Like, what are we trying to do in this space? It, and it fascinates me endlessly. I love thinking about it. I love talking about it. Um, I've gone on for a little while, but I think your question was about, you know, the line between personal and, and public. I mean, I think 
I feel really content with most of my personal life being online. Like, you know, I don't really share my relationship online. I, I don't really ever put my home on my Instagram. I, I'm, I'm really careful. And I think it's just because I don't, I'm very aware that I don't know. I guess I, it's funny. You know, I just, I think it's just, it's, it's become more of a personal choice. Like it's, it's okay. It's really okay. And also I think over the years I've really struggled with people meeting people who only know me online and hearing their versions of who they think I am or their impressions mm. of my life based on what I've posted and it feeling really almost like a violation in how inaccurate it is. And I realized that I just, I, I'm okay I'm okay not feeding into those projections or fantasies anymore because they're so disturbing to come up against. Um, yeah. And, and also they're none of your business. They have nothing to do yeah. with you. Yeah. I, that's like something I always have to go back to is that because I experience the same thing and I feel the same way. And it's almost one of those things that makes you feel like you have to share. Like, am I being honest enough? I feel like I'm one of the most honest people I know. I tell so much of the truth. I mm-hmm. tell too much of the truth sometimes. So when when it is like people have an impression of you that's so off or so mis I'm so misrepresentative. Mm-hmm. And to me it's like a running joke. I've never done an interview in over ten years. I've never done a single interview that's ever been hundred percent accurate. Mm-hmm. It has always mm-hmm. misrepresented me in some way, at least the initial publishing of it. So if it's online, we can always try to do something about it. But once it's, there's so many print stories of me out there that I know, like if in five, 10, 20 years, somebody reads that it's going to be just be so inaccurate. And it's so devastating because maybe that's, maybe that's why I feel like I have to tell the truth so much because I want people to know that what they're reading is not, is not me. Because especially when you are a part of a sub community, your representation is through a very specific lens. They, you, they, they figure out which boxes you check off. And that's not just like a diversity box, but just every, any box that they're looking for, like for this story or for whatever it is. And then everything goes through that lens. And so it's always a bias. There's always a bias in you. That's why I don't believe in Like, I don't think that the traditional way we've learned about objectivity is real. Hi there. If you find our work beneficial and you want to support how we build our company at your service, you can subscribe to my Patreon at patreon.com slash nor. It's usually personal writings and as I build a community on there, hopefully more. Your support is how we build. I also curate a weekly newsletter of all the things I'm benefiting from and enjoying that week. Anything from what I'm reading, watching, listening, buying, and more. Like most things, I keep it personal. You can subscribe to it at nortagori.com slash newsletter. Now back to the story. How do you feel about traditional journalism, journalistic objectivity, especially mm-hmm. because you work at a traditional outlet? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I was also going to ask you, I mean, what's, what's the one thing that outlets tend to get wrong that you wish they would get right about you? Sometimes it's as basic as like me being born here and not being my both my parents are from Libya um I mean it's all it's been anywhere from being misidentified and misrepresented in Vogue and being a completely different person to news outlets using my photo for uh the wife of the Pulse nightclub shooting because we had the same first name, but she doesn't wear a hijab and I wear a hijab. People thought, you know, this looks more accurate. Oh, to, that's so devastating. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The most common thing, though, is the tone and the lens. I just did a really big spread for a publication that goes to print. And the title of it was, or on the cover, it said, um, Nor Tagore finds her voice. I've always had a voice. I feel like mm-hmm. that just goes into like the stereotype of Muslim women not having a voice. I literally mm-hmm. teach people how to speak. Mm-hmm. And then the title of the piece was 
me like not having shackles on anymore. Like that was the title of the whole piece. Oh uh-uh, no. <laughs> so it was just like, oh my god. It's always deficit framing. Like even if I do, especially when I do network interviews, it's always like prefaced, like the questions are always prefaced with me already being hated or my community being hated or us being whatever or us being, and I get so nervous when I do cable network interviews because I'm trying to like balance not being on the defense and also giving an accurate answer, but also feeling like the questions that they're asking me assume that one Muslim can represent an entire population and that's not true. So I'm just like, do you correct someone on air? Do you just ask, answer the question? Because I, I have to unlearn, and I would love to know this about you too, but I have to unlearn so much of like doing stories for the white gaze. I'm working on this documentary about representation. And even as I work on it, in the beginning, I had to ask myself, who am I doing this for? Who am I doing this for? Is this for us? Like, is this for our community's healing? If this is for our community's healing, then this and this and this need to be changed. And my instinct when developing something like this is making sure that they think I'm normal or I, they think I'm a good person or I, they think I'm this and this. I thought that that was over, but it's not. It's still mm-hmm. there and you just have to be so conscious of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. You know, I think it's so interesting, this question of objectivity as well, because even even in hearing you describe your experience, I mean, those headline writers and all those publications and, and outlets, I mean, they're not aware of their own biases. And I, I think even something like, yeah, Nora Finds Her Voice is like not aware of their perceptions of Muslim women, and, and that's why they write it in that way. And so I, I just, I don't know, I, I just, I find it to be really interesting because most people aren't even aware of their own biases. They aren't aware of like why certain headlines feel familiar or right. And, and I remember early on in my career, gosh, what was the story about? Mm, I don't remember. It may come to me in a minute or two, but I remember working on a piece and the my editor, this is like many, many, many years ago when I was an intern, my editor really wanted the headline to be like so-and-so speaking in tongues. And it was about a black person, a black artist and I was like, you know, I just kept saying absolutely not and that's that's not appropriate, you know, and, and that's playing into these ideas of some, there's just some some undertone that I couldn't articulate in the moment and I was just like, I really feel uncomfortable, I would rather use this and they were just really pushing at me like, no, this sounds better and I was like, but what are you trying to say with that, you know, and I, I remember being you know, really uncomfortable because there's so many power dynamics at play, like you're hopeful, you know, you, you are you know, you you are pushing up against someone's assumptions, their knowledge, their position over you, the hierarchy of institutions, and um, especially being, it, it was within a predominantly white institution, so even being in that infrastructure, you're already feeling, you know, less uh, empowered to, it's just, it's, it's, an, it's so hard to even be there in ways that I think, you just, I, for at least for me, the ways I just kind of ignored and shut out and, and didn't understand why I was so stressed and so uncomfortable all the time, but I was just trying. I didn't understand that this was, you know, a function of, of, of being in an environment where I was, you know, um, underrepresented and just didn't feel super, w- I mean, I felt welcome, but, you know, it's, it's hard when you are super aware of other people's ideas of why you might be there, right? Like, you know, I've, I'm, I feel like so many moments in my life you know, was told like, oh, you're a diversity hire, you got in because of affirmative action or things like that. And so it just kind of creates this idea that you're not, you don't actually belong. And so it's very hard to undo that. And so even when you're in environments that are welcoming, there's still always this seed underneath of like, what do people really think of? And, and, you know, it gives you an an inferiority complex. There was a great Harvard Business Review piece not too long ago that was like, stop telling women they have imposter syndrome. And it was like, you know, imposter syndrome is the function of being in environments constantly where you feel unworthy and it's gaslighting to tell women like you just got to own it like make it your own it's like that undermines and undercuts the Whoa. very real experiences of not feeling held and not feeling supported you know and, and it was I'll, I'll send it to you later if you want but I was just sort of like that reframing was so I was like wow that is super deep um and I've been I would uh, mentoring. love that Thank yeah you. yeah I literally talk about imposter syndrome all the time but liter- just hearing you say that one line is already shocking and also 
See, I told you, I still have all these internalized narratives. Yeah. Well, it's real. I mean, I think I think it is real, you know, to some degree to feel, you know, I, I mean, I think there are two things happening in that piece. One thing is, I, I do think it's actually really valid to feel like, you know, a lot of folks, and myself included, kind of live life like we're always waiting for life to start or the build up or things feel like a dress rehearsal. And I think that's yeah. one element of what we might call imposter syndrome. But I also think saying, you know, like chalking things up, chalking a lack of infrastructure support, a lack of um, wow, a lack yeah. of acknowledgement of microaggressions that people deal with to just imposter syndrome. I think that's kind of what the piece is also talking about. Like there's mm. some things about it that are super real. We've all felt like you're like, oh my God, I'm not ready for this yet. But also there is this element of like, you know, it might be a reflection of not feeling <laughs> like you belong, you know? Do you have a specific memory that of an experience that you went through where that was confirmed, where you thought it was imposter syndrome or you thought you were like something was a little bit off and then either a supervisor or someone or managing editor, whoever said something to you and you were like, ah, okay, cool. So like what I felt was real. I mean, I think throughout my career, I've tried to, um, I, I had many moments of feeling like, I want to work on this big piece or I want to be ambitious in this way and kind of being told like mm, either we're not interested or we're not sure that's right or or maybe the subtext is you're not quite ready but not being given the tools to figure out how to get ready and I'm such a doer you know like especially early on mm. in my career I was such a like you know give me the give me the night class like I'll take the seminar like I'll figure it out like I just love learning and love knowing and I think it was hard to feel like what are the pathways towards my goals? Like what are, how do I chart my way towards what do I want? Um, and over the years, what I've wanted has shifted. So it's, 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 you know, things have changed for me, but yes, absolutely feeling like being told, you know, you aren't ready for this, but not being given the tools to get there. I mean, I think that, that affirms feelings of unworthiness. But actually when you were talking, I think something else came up for me, which is I, I was really lucky in my, career as a tech journalist, which I still do, but I, I was really a hardcore tech reporter for a while. Um, my editors were always throwing me into impossible situations, you know, and I, I say that lovingly, like, I think they were like, you got this. Like, they were always like, yeah, go interview the CEO. And like, they, they really just like, you know, I don't know, they really were just like, go for it. And I, I remember feeling like they had such undying trust in my ability and belief and that was incredible and I think that's really rare and I think um I did have a team of editors all white men all cis white men you know old men not old they were older um they would kill me if they hear me saying that but they were older <laughs> but they were very like you know they were super encouraging and and I I never felt you know, I don't know. They just really believed in my ideas and my desires to just be ambitious. And so I, I think that's unusual at the times. I think that's unusual for women who work in the business department. And I feel, I, I think that's, that's, that's a huge part of why I'm still intact all these years later. Um, because I had such a loving cocoon of people who wow. really did not want me to fail, who recruited that's me. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I originally was like, I can't do this job. I'm just like this 24-year-old blogger. I know nothing about being a reporter. And they were they really broke it down for me. They were like, look at this blog post. Do you think you can do this? Like, we'll help you. We'll be reading over your shoulder. We'll be making sure you're, you know, because I didn't have any journalism background. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I was, I was on the cusp of either applying to J School at Berkeley or taking this job as a blogger at the New York Times. And they convinced me, like, we will not Which let you Which is fail. basically J School. It it really and I I'm such a trial by fire. Like I would not have done well. I don't think going back into into an academic environment. I'm such a trial by fire. So for me, for them to be like, yep, go to this press conference, take notes, file a piece, twenty minutes. You know, I was just like, you got it. Like tap me and coach. Like I loved it. Actually, I really loved it. But I do. I mean, I'm also still thinking about this question you asked a few moments ago about decentering the white gaze, and I I do feel like that's been my life's work. You know, I do feel like that's been something I've had to really become conscious of and reroute and redirect and, and really be mindful of, yeah, like who are these pieces for? What are these things about? Um, it's a big part of why 
I wanted to work on Black Futures with Kimberly. I felt, I felt, Kimberly Drew, I felt really strongly like I was struggling to write about uh, my communities and my areas of interest without explaining it or overly explicating right. it. And I'm not interested in, in literacy, right? I'm not interested in legibility. I don't, I think I kind of let myself write pieces. I mean, I had, I'd been used to writing pieces that kind of broke down technology. So when I started writing about culture, you know, it, uh, you know, I was encouraged to do the same thing. And then I kind of realized I don't want to explain, like who else has to explain themselves in this way, you know? And I also felt really keen that I, it's not for me to change the way an institution does its job. Like I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to leave an imprint, hopefully many you know, fingerprints all over this place before I go, but that's not my fight. That's a really old fight. I would rather make something different entirely. Like I would rather, and I also wanted to work in collaboration because be, I mean, you collaborate when you're a reporter, you have your editors, you know, et cetera, but you're not like conceiving of the thing together. You're not executing the thing together, you know? And I, I felt like I really wanted to see what it would feel like to not be such a lone wolf all the time. And I really wanted to deep dive into black culture. And I just, I wanted to change my life. And so I was just like, I'd like to do it in this other way. Like, I don't want to appeal to the interests of this very white institution. I actually want to build something that is not reliant on this at all. So yeah, I, I hear your question. And I think it's something we kind of have to do because Otherwise, you spend so much time appealing for legibility, which is a way of asking for validation, which I, you know, I don't know if we're ever going to get. So it becomes really <laughs> important to validate yourself for your own life, you know, and, and for your own, I don't know. I don't know how to finish that sentence, but I, I just think you kind of have to find that. This is such a like Hallmark card, but you do have to actually find that within yourself for yourself and not expect other yeah. people to give it to you because then you're always reaching, you know, you're always reaching. Well, Black Futures is an archive of this moment in time. It is an anthology that you and Kimberly Drew co-edited together. And it's one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen. It truly is one of the most beautiful books. Thank you for what? saying that. Of course. How did the process of building the book Black Futures apply to your self-healing? Oh boy, I love this question. Yeah, over the years, it's always been my dream to have a constellation of projects that all feed into each other that ultimately feed into me and allow me to pursue my interests and you know all nourish me like I always I view everything in life as an assignment like how can I you know if I want to learn about carpentry okay well let me write a piece about furniture building I don't know that's just like how I think <laughs> I'm also trying to like deprogram that out of myself and just I can imp I can explore things and do things just for the sake of it. Like I'm really into privacy in that way. And it doesn't have to be, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of our chat, I had gotten this sound teacher training right before the pandemic started. And I've been asked since the pandemic to do, you know, sound baths. Sound baths are incredible. I actually really, I'm so excited that you brought that up because I, I want to hear more about this. And just the reason I asked a question about healing in this way is one, because I realize that the project that I'm working on right now, which is not the same, but parallel, it feels a little familiar to this, is because I'm trying to figure out my own healing and also mm -hmm. because I love hearing you talk about the different things that you do that I know that you're really doing, that you're doing for healing. The things that you enjoy to do similar to the sound training where I'm just like, oh cool, she's working on her spirit. I love that. I really want to learn. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I'd been asked several times to do a sound bath and I was just like, you know, by, by big organizations or big institutions or like an Instagram live. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think um, it's a practice that I, I do see it as a community oriented practice. Like I do see it as part of um, my activism, which I'm still figuring out, but I, I do feel very, you know, um, devoted to healing justice and, and thinking about what does it mean to apply a framework of um, racial awareness and, and, you know, being trauma aware and sensitive to modalities of he healing and just recognizing that it's not just about whatever, you know, mainstream and dominant culture decides is healing. It's about, yeah, deep, devoted spiritual practices that um, 
can be tailored to a specific group or community and those needs. And, and I think I, f I feel that really strongly and it's, it's not something that's just like, oh yeah, like I, I got asked to do a demo for some, I don't know, for some, some compilation video. And I was just like, I can just, I mean, this is a projection and I don't know how it would have been represented, but in my mind's eye, I was like, I can just see this, you know, video happening. And then I appeared, there's like incense burning and there's like a gong hit. And I'm like, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to run the risk of something I care so deeply about being trivialized or, or, or made bite size for maybe a punchline, or I just didn't know how it would be used. And I was just like, it's cool. I can say no. And it's, it's one of the first things in my life, you know, because so much of what I do and what I'm interested in is parsed out for commercial appeal, you know, and, and it feels really nice to have something that I get to say no, no to, and I can just use it in the way that, um, it's intended to be used, you know, like I can say like, oh, this is actually right now I'm only offering sound baths to, you know, black trans folks in my community. And, and that's fine. Like that's enough. And, and that is such a gift. I'm like, oh, thank God. Um, but you know, yeah, I think black features is part of, it is, it is a deep, it, it's a deep curiosity for me. It's something, you know, being able to just spend time diving into all the areas of black history and black culture that I care so deeply about and, and weren't able, you know, when I started working on the book, I reached out to Kimberly because I really admired her work and I thought we would make great partners. And I, and I was still in a reporter mindset where, I mean, I love being a reporter. I wonder if this is true for you too, because you kind of get to be nosy and you get to reach out to people and be like, yes. Hey, can we talk? You know, it's like the best excuse for being outgoing. And I'm a little bit of an introvert. I realize I'm an introvert in denial. I'm a little bit of an introvert. And so I use that as a way to be, extroverted although now I'm kind of moving out of it I'm not I'm not as self-conscious as I used to be in my late 20s early 30s but um at the time you know 2015 2014 there there is a lot more um awareness right now of of you know folks like publications are aware that they need to be more dynamic and like look outward to communities they need to have more writers of color more writers of different backgrounds you know they in order to be relevant right but back in 2015 that wasn't as normalized and I just I felt it felt really hard to appeal to the things that I was interested in exploring and find a placement for them and like I said before I didn't want to have to do it from a lens of framing this artist or musician I was interested in writing about as going mainstream or, or all, you know what I mean like I didn't want to have to qualify them through this white lens to justify why we were writing about them and I again like I also just felt like I wanted to see who I was outside of the times because I'd been there for so long. And so I think in terms of, you know, the book was really healing in that sense where I felt a lot of validity for my interest. I felt a lot of encouragement through Kimberly. You know, our friendship is one of the great loves of my life. I think that's mutual. And it really was just such a trust fall from the jump. And so I think it really helped me learn a little bit more about unconditional love it helped me learn more about partnerships it helped me learn more about you know the value of a person over the value of their productivity you know because kimberly and i are both really fierce protectors of each other's free time and also making sure that you know every time we sit down to work we have a work session right after this and i know we'll spend the first 20 minutes just like how are you like how are you doing what's on your heart you know and those things are healing for me, right? That that there is a way to have healthy intimacy, a healthy business relationship. And there's a way to, you know, make the things you want to see in the world and not have them destroy you. Cause that's also a fear that I have that, wow, yeah. you know, that, that, that your ambition will be the end of you. Like that's something I worry about all the time. Like, is there a healthy enough balance in my life? It's hard when we do what we do because it's like the ambition is the, the ambition and the work is personal like mm -hmm. our careers are so personal it's your mm -hmm. it's your thoughts it's your words it's your voice that's the thing about journalism and storytelling in general and i really appreciate you i hope talking about this and i hope i can take this question to this level which is what i'm very curious about because you mentioned activism i remember when i started I, i've been working as a journalist since i was 16 years old so 11 years and I was always called an activist before I was called hmm. a journalist. I was always hmm. called an activist 
even if I was working in a journalism job. And I realized it was because I wore a hijab while I reported. And so they were like, oh, she's standing for something. She's an activist. Now, as someone who did go to a traditional journalism school, I went to Maryland in College Park, which we can talk about that after, DMV. Um, I hated it. I remember I wrote a piece about it and the blurred lines between journalism and activism. And I was so mad because I was like, you're only calling me this because of what I choose to wear and you're dis you're taking away from people who are activists who say they're activists and you're not crediting me properly as a journalist when I'm fighting so hard to be a journalist in this space and doing something different and now my thoughts on this are evolving because things are changing and because again I realize it was because I was trying to appeal to a certain gaze. Every single one of my journalism professors were older white men, except for one who was an Indian American woman who taught journalism in the Middle East and North Africa. And I even just watched the Bob Woodward masterclass on investigative journalism, obviously a legendary journalist, but I didn't agree with some of the stuff that he was saying. And I realized he can only say that because of the position that he's in. I would love to know from you because you are dealing with this activism area what does it mean to you to be a journalist and an activist can the two go together like what is this baby that we are creating moving Mm -hmm. forward for the next generations because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we are having to like figure that out right now Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well you know to clarify i mean i having spent time in Over the summer, I went to Minneapolis to write about some of the organizations working on the ground and their work to try to get the city of Minneapolis to abolish the police. And, you know, those those are a different type of activists. Like those are real devoted lifelong organizers. And they're 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 working in in a really long lineage and tradition of, you know, folks at the the Highlander Institute and like Mary Hooks and, and, you know, just a really specific um, realm of trying to create a really specific kind of change. I mean, they are, they are the real deal, right? I, when I was there, I, that was when I first heard about healing justice and it's, I think it was just such a really fecund, just a really ripe time in my life that really reshaped me. And I, you know, I wanted to do that piece because I didn't know, I didn't really know what organizing work looked like. Like I had a curiosity and I, I felt I also felt kind of devoted to, you know, the Times had written, so right now I work for the Times Magazine, and the Times Magazine at the beginning of, I guess what we call now the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, when it was really coming together in 2012, 2013, we wrote a huge cover story on um, the, the beginnings of this national movement. So in that piece, they didn't really write about Alicia Garza, you know, Patrice Cullors, Opal Tomati, and the work that they had been doing on the ground with also Chicago organizers like Charlene Crothers. And I just, I really felt in real time, like, oh my God, I just witnessed, you know, three queer black women. I guess I'm not sure Opal identifies as queer, but anyway, the the point I'm trying to make is I, I felt in real time witnessing black women being written out of history. And I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, you know, and I know this, you know, I have all empathy to the author of that story. And I, I, I understood it came together really quickly and they wrote about what they saw. And that's why in Black Features, you know, one of the first pieces we have is that exchange between Alicia and Patrice, right? Like, you know, seeing my role as a cultural producer, which is what I'll say, right? In, in terms of encompassing everything, all the work I do, including journalism, it feels like a real imperative and a real objective to me. I deeply care about the record. I deeply care about the archive, you know, so that's kind of how I view my role and my work. You know, I wanted to make sure there was a piece in the New York Times that accurately reflected what these organizers were trying to do. And we were in the midst, too, of a moment this summer of writing about, you know, what would it mean to get rid of the police? And, and a lot of the pieces were kind of reckless. And, you know, we were still calling the uprising riots and we were still writing about, you know, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor from these perspectives of people who, you know, either couldn't help what happened to them or they'd gotten in harm's way or they had done something to deserve it. And so I felt like it was my moral imperative to write a piece mm-hmm. that reflected 
those historical events differently, right? I can't do anything about these other pieces, but what I can do is create a piece that, you know, tells another version of the same events, you know? And so that to me, if I think about any type of activism, I think thinking about the historical record as a type of activism um, and multiple perspectives, that's kind of where I sit in that, that, in that intersection. And now my own personal life, I, when I was in Minneapolis, you know, a lot of the folks I was meeting were, they were interested in healing justice. They were, they were working in healing modalities themselves. You know, I don't call myself a healer. I think, you know, we started out this conversation talking about, you know, we, we kind of find our own ways to medicine. I think good practitioners just lead people back to themselves. I think they just kind of walk people back towards their own medicine or they open them up enough to know, um, to recognize what they're seeking, to recognize what they need, you know? So that's, that's just to clarify. Cause I think it's important to say too, because, um, within the communities that I work within, being called a healer is a little controversial for good reason. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the storytelling session. I just wanted to share something with you. If you're looking for a good deed opportunity these days, my family has been working to alleviate local homelessness for over 10 years. We have a foundation called I See You, and we make care packages for people experiencing homelessness. We make family food bags with food staples and give out grocery gift cards to families in need and more. Everything is done by donation and 100% of the money goes towards community members in need. If you'd like to donate, you can through Venmo at at ISY Foundation or PayPal to contact at isyfoundation.org. If you or someone you know is in need in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia area and could use our help, please DM on Instagram, ISY Foundation, or shoot us an email. Now back to our story. So I was I was learning a lot about healing justice and I was reading about women like Kara Page and you know Prentice Hemphill and I was and Joseph Beam and I was and I knew about Joseph Beam who's a poet but I didn't know how much they were kind of a healthcare worker and a, and a healthcare practitioner and you know I was just like whoa like I felt like I was really walking into a I, I had stepped through a doorway I felt like it was such a divine intervention in terms of how I was supposed to think about my own practice, which is still evolving because we're in a pandemic still. And, you know, I want to make these things available, but it's hard to practice such intimate work um, while we're still, you know, dealing with a really contagious airborne virus. But I, I think it really shaped my own desires to work in you know, yeah, somebody asked, I always say kind of oriented towards community justice because I want to be really mindful of the people who do this work full time. And, and, and for me, I'm not there yet. And so I, I do think about this work in, you know, in a very personal, in a, in a very personal way, but I, I understand the question that you're asking and it's, and it's a much bigger question. And, and the last thing I'll say is I've been thinking a lot about Wesley Lowry, who's a journalist who got into a lot of hot water. <laughs> That's such a pat way to say it, but, you know, kind of, clashed with the tension between journalism and activists or what his bosses at the time assumed to be activism because he was in Ferguson, because he was having a heated personal reaction to what he was seeing on the ground and he was tweeting right. about it. And so he got typecast as an activist first and a journalist second. And he's still writing about it. You know, he's still talking about being fired and the work he's doing now. And he's still like, you know, reflecting on the fact that, you know, six years or so ago, six or seven years ago, not pretending to be objective because he's upset watching the police attack protesters, right? Christian Amanpour said this while she was reporting in Bosnia. Objectivity doesn't mean drawing a false moral equivalence. Like there is an oppressor and there is the oppressed. And you have to be able to acknowledge those because in so many stories where there's an oppressor and there's an oppressed, the way I was taught, at least, and the way that I've seen a lot of journalists that I went to school with report is that they're on the same playing field. And so we have to give this person equal airtime to this person. And if this person is being oppressed in X, Y, and Z ways, well, what are the justifications from this side? And like, and that doesn't, that's not right. That's not how we should be archiving our history because for so long, history has been written by the survivors and the people who got to publish these books. And it's, and we, we don't even acknowledge that everything that we know or that we're taught in school is a has a bias on it and, and a lot right. of it is inaccurate because it's been it's written by 
whatever. That's a whole other thing. But I, but I battle with this so much because I remember writing a long time ago when that I was getting called an activist so much. It felt out of my control. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I was like, I'm, but this is not, but this is not what I do. This is not what I identify as. And then, and then I said, well, then if you're going to call me that, call me that for the way that I report on stories, because I do report on stories differently. I felt so strongly that whoever was calling me that was taking away from the people who were doing the work on the ground and the people whose entire life work is their activism. And mine is a storyteller. Like I, I, I tell stories on what I see and what I feel and what I'm doing and I just, I, I, I don't have a conclusion for that. I'm still struggling with it. But it's really hopeful and helpful to see now that journalists like Wesley are seen as journalists because you should have that reaction. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you should be outraged. And that isn't, there is no side to that. And the more that we say that there is a side to that, the more we are discrediting people who have been oppressed experience. And I think that's yeah. so wrong. I know. I, I, I mean, he, he really has not let the ball drop and I, and he keeps tweeting about it and he keeps writing about it. And I think it's really important to remember that, you know, this is recent history and, and it would seem, I think, I mean, it's still a battle that's going on, but I think he, he really is right to keep reminding people that he was ostracized and he was ousted for, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's things that now, I mean, especially after the summer, I don't think people, well, I do know a lot of black journalists felt like they couldn't speak as freely as they wanted to, and certainly not during the last administration. None of us could, you know, but I do think it, it is coming up, you know, again and again, like how it, it doesn't make sense to ignore the ways in which journalists are impacted by the events that they're covering. And I, I mean, it, it, it feels like, you know, an, a pretty obvious thing that that is now starting to become normalized. But I will say that, I mean, like any other institution that's ri that's ripe for an overhaul and review, I mean, journalism is 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 certainly, you know, and, it, and the media landscape has been so decimated. Like, that's something I keep thinking about, too, is that, you know, we've watched so many smaller publications, slightly more independent publications just disappear and everything's kind of getting folded up into the same three institutions. And so they're becoming more powerful and they're becoming all, more all encompassing, which in some ways is good, but it also doesn't necessarily mean that there is as much accountability and counter views as there used to be. And, and so, I don't know, I do wonder about that as well, but, but there's no doubt that so much in media needs to be overhauled and reconsidered in, in the same way that all these other institutions have been up for review and, you know, that, you know, since last summer, I feel like that's been a, that's been an ongoing conversation. And it's, I mean, we're, if we're, if it's not already happening now, it's like, we're next. Like it's, it's just bound to happen. So. Yep. You also mentioned the, the term typecast and that is a, that term makes me feel things because I fought so hard to make sure that I wasn't typecast in a s specific thing. There's this question that I've been pondering that I don't have an exact answer to, but I remember when I first was getting into journalism, I tried to make sure that I wasn't covering Muslim stories because I didn't want to be the person, the Muslim person who covered Muslim stories. And I was covering all other different stories. But there were times where I saw colleagues cover the Muslim related stories and completely butcher them. They were so misrepresentative and it was so infuriating because it was just like, you were working two jobs because you had to, once things were published or once, once things went on air, you had to have those conversations about the mistakes that were made. And then you ask yourself like, should I have covered that story? Cause I would have been the best person to cover that story. Should they have consulted with me? But that isn't my job. That was their assignment. That was their job. Shouldn't they have spent time building trust with the community or asking or, or reaching out or doing their due diligence, but they don't. And we are such a misrepresented community. So do you know of an appropriate way that people should go about covering stories that are not related to their communities? And how do we mm. navigate this internal battle where we, we know that we can do it better because we feel it and we have that experience, but also I don't want to like, that's not yeah. what I want to cover all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be you. I mean, one of the mm -hmm. ways I'm working on this is I'm, I'm part of a really active mentorship program called Perry plus that I was, I, I'm, I'm not organ an organizer, but I was, I feel like I was an early, um, 
participate in the program because I just felt so strongly about it. Um, and I, I really want to help. I didn't really have too many mentors from a similar background. So I really wanted to make myself available for writers coming up now. And I wanted to be a resource and I want to make myself available. So that's one, that's one thing, right? And so then when these questions come up, we can talk about it and questions of ownership and questions of, you know, who gets to cover what, can anybody write about anything? I mean, this is such an ongoing topic and I, I do want to always participate in conversations around it. And, and I also think, I mean, it's such a systemic challenge, right? Because it's not just about the reporter, but you know, they're not the only ones touching that story. There is a top editor, there's a copy editor, depending on the outlet, you know, sometimes there's a photo editor. I mean, sometimes there's a fact checker. I mean, again, like because media has changed so much, these things are in such short supply and I'm not sure there's the, the, you know, even when they, anyway, even when media was in its salad days, you know, be, this, these things were still complicated, right? Because everybody involved may have had their own biases that may have also led to a story that's misrepresentative. But, but I still think, you know, ideally there is someone in this chain who's like, did you talk to a community leader? Did you talk to, you know, what was your, what was your process? What was your protocol? And unfortunately, I think a lot of these things happen retroactively. I think pieces come out, you know, Twitter works in the ways that it's really good at, which is it's highlighting, you know, a deficit or highlighting um, a short site, right, or a shortcoming. And then there's kind of a period of backpedaling and, you know, but but people shouldn't be learning by error. You know, it shouldn't be, it should be trial by fire like that. Like there should be more due diligence up front because yeah, of course, in theory, anybody can cover anything, but we have to be so aware of what we assume are biases. And I think it, I think being a good journalist also requires a lot of humility about what you don't know. You know, and I think that's something that I was taught, like it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to admit, you know, you don't know everything. And I think there's a lot of ego involved and I think people are like, oh yeah, 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 I got that. You know, rather than, you know, asking the obvious questions, people kind of skip over that. Well, that's a given. We're like, no, but maybe it's not. Maybe you should start from the most basic level. Um, and even when they do, I think, yeah, sometimes you do have editors who are trying to shape a narrative. So it's, it's such a multifaceted, multi-pronged problem, but I do think as, you know, conscientious journalists, we have to really protect our stories. We have to protect our sources. We have to protect the headlines. We have to ask to see the images. You know, I think we have to be really careful. Um, and something I'm really grateful for. And I mean, I think you know, in this last year of the pandemic, newsrooms have gone mostly digital. But I've noticed in my own newsroom, um, I mean, it's not, again, because I work at the magazine, I'm not really in the newsroom, but I do look at our slacks often. And I feel like I've seen such dynamic conversations that are happening in a way that would not have happened if we were still in, in you know, our siloed newsroom. But because we're in slacks and anybody can jump in, it's like, people can jump into the Asian American affinity group and say, well, how are we covering these shootings? Like, what are we talking about? What are the guidelines? Are our stories adhering to the guidelines that AAPI.org put out? You know, and I think I've, I've noticed that happening faster in real time or when a story about um, all these anti-trans bills and legislations are going out like in the kind of queer affinity group people are saying or in the in the affinity group that has to or the channel that has to do that was organized by uh, non-binary and trans journalists it's like making sure that the sources in a story are not anti-trans representatives you know like is this a balanced piece because um, and I see more asks for sensitivity reads. I see people asking for gut checks on things, gut checks on photos, gut checks on headlines. And that to me feels so incredibly exciting, even though I worry about the labor because I'm always like the first to be like, people should be compensated for that time. It's not fair. The most marginalized in this newsroom are being asked to do more work. Historically, we're paid less, you know? Um, and so I always chime up and say that. And then there's like crickets. And, and then someone's like, I enjoy doing it. I don't mind. And I'm like, that's not the point, you know. But again, this yeah. is why you need unions that represent these interests. But anyway. Um, I struggle I, with, I always struggle yeah. with that too. I think that as a journalist or storyteller, like I will always say I'm available for this. Unless I'm not, obviously. But at the same time, I say I'm available for this. But that doesn't mean that everybody who yeah. is related to these stories is like that that doesn't mean all of a sudden like they're your go-to person because I've had people say to me I, I remember one woman stood up at in a in a talk in the audience of a talk I was giving and she was so emotional she was an older woman and she was just like I just want to have a bad day like I just want to go out and like I want to have a bad day and I feel like I can't yeah I was just like yeah you're right 
feel like I can't have a bad day either. Like I can't be mad. I can't be upset. I can't be like, I can't just be going through stuff in my own personal because like what, because the question always goes like, what if you're the only person that they see that day? Or what if that's the only piece that they read that day? Or what if that, Mm. or not even that day, but just in general, especially, I mean, in our community, I think like 30% of Americans have met a Muslim or something like that. So it's just like, you feel such a heavy, heavy, heavy responsibility no matter yeah. what community you're a part of because you just don't want people to, I don't know, you don't want people to think badly of you because they already do. It's like you're fighting something. You're fighting mm-hmm. another narrative. Mm-hmm. And, in, and sometimes the best that you get is just like you're one of the good ones and that's just mm. not the point. Like that's not mm. true either. Yeah, the burden of representation is real and it's hard and there isn't an easy answer to it. I think I've found solace by the privilege of, of having worked in this business long enough to be like, now I'm making things that I care about. Like I'm my first yeah. audience and that is such a luxury, but I do empathize. And I, again, I think I, my only contribution right now is to try to mentor other journalists and just kind of passing the mantle a little mm-hmm. bit because I just don't know if, if that's the fight I want to fight anymore. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. Cause it's never ending. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the great thing is also that there's so many young journalists who are coming up. Like I, I will say one of the biggest honors that I've had over the years is so many young Muslim hijab wearing women saying I'm pursuing journalism because of you. And I'm That's just like, incredible. and it's not because I helped them. What It's just like you just showing up and doing it in a, in a space that like didn't have you before just opens up the doors for so many other people to do it and, and bring up the conversation around why we didn't do this in the first place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We talked about things getting closer to an exit right now. Things are starting to feel a little bit more normal. Mm-hmm. But where do we put all of this energy that we have accumulated over the last year or so? And mm. how do you f- see or feel that we should use that energy? Or how do we keep it up moving forward? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's a big worry that I have, you know, that all of the emotion and all of the discomfort and the anger that really erupted last summer just disappears. And it won't, right? I mean, I think we're kind of in a series of awakenings. I think there's a se- we're, we're in the midst of one right now where we're having such a dynamic and, you know, and passionate um, and overdue conversation about um, xenophobia and anti-American, anti-Asian American sentiment in this country. And, and it's really, I mean, it's, it's so, it really is, it feels really heartbreaking that it's only happening in the wake of such a tragic event. Um, but it also, I mean, it reminds me that these, so many of these conversations are so overdue. And so I think, Mm -hmm. I don't think it ends. I think we've actually maybe adopted a new blueprint for, figuring out how to talk about them and figuring out how to show up in solidarity and whether that's emotional or political or even just social solidarity. Like, what does that look like? Um, And I think I was really grateful to learn over the summer. I mean, I knew this, but I don't think I quite really had integrated it, how long movements take and how long, I mean, these are, these are lifetime projects. These are not Mm -hmm. summer long affairs. It's not one year. I mean, I think everybody gets to decide what they do with what they've learned in the last year as we come out of the pandemic. I don't even know what it means to come out of the pandemic. I also have a lot of worries that right now there's just kind of like a white collar worker, a middle class inoculation that's happening and that the uneven distribution, I don't know. I'm, I'm really keeping a close eye on like who's getting vaccinated and who's not and who it's hard for and what that's going to mean in six months. But, but I do think it's an individual choice. Like we all have a personal responsibility to decide how we show up in the aftermath, you know? Totally. Thank you for being so open and honest Mm. with us. Mm. I appreciate that so much about you. You and Wesley both. I mean, just such magic. And I've learned so much about healthy friendships from you both. So Mm -hmm. thank you. (laughs) And and you and Kimberly. I mean, Kimberly is also one of my favorite people. So I'm just, this is just so much love. And I'm so, so grateful for your time. Mm. Before I go into some rapid fire questions, how can we all be of service to you these days? Oh my gosh. I mean, you know, I think that's such a beautiful question. And I would just say, putting yourself first, taking care of yourself, you know? I mean, Mm. we live in such a, such a productivity oriented culture, um, 
that my only advice ever is just like rest more, drink more water, think about <laughs> one thing that would make you happy today and try to find time for it. Yes. <laughs> Thank uh, you for that reminder. I know. I realized recently like Wesley never drinks water during our recording sessions, which will sometimes will be like three hours. And I was like, I need to see you drinking water. Like I just. That's a real I, friend. Yeah. I need to see you with a glass of water by you. Like, come on. Real friends text each other as a reminder to drink water. Yeah. Just like, how are you caring for yourself today? And even if the answer is, <laughs> yes. I don't know, at least it starts the thought process that maybe it's something to consider, you know? Of course. Of course. Okay. So rapid, rapid, rapid fire questions, but they're not so rapid because they're <laughs> questions. Anyway. Um, okay. The book that we all need to read right now. Uh, what came to mind for me immediately is Love and Rage, The Path of Liberation Through Anger by Lama Rod Owens, which I've been reading and it's totally changing my life. First of all, I'm such a scholar of Buddhism and I love black queer Dharma teachers who really try to take the principles of Buddhism and apply them to everyday life. And this book is really about feeling your feelings and taking away the shame of anger, but understanding anger is an engine for something that you want to change. And it's just a really great, I mean, speaking of like continuing the feelings from last year in the summer, I mean, it's such a great book for how to level out and how to like hold yourself through all the difficulties mm. um, and stay invigorated and stay devoted to life. It's a great book. That's I'm, I'm literally reading, I'm reading a book on codependency right now. And I just <laughs> yes. read a couple of chapters on anger and the shame around anger mm -hmm. and one of the one of the lines that i was just like whoa was people assume that anger is a sinful feeling and i feel like that's a pretty universal thing because we always think that it's a it's bad to be angry like you shouldn't be angry like you have to do something to fix this mm -hmm. instead of listening to it and i just realized like that's such a fallacy like that's not true mm. anyway. A song you go back to for joy. Oh my gosh. Um, my mind goes to Alice Coltrane. I love this album, Afro Harping by Dorothy Ashby. It's, it's such an incredible album. She is a, a, jazz musician, a jazz musician from Detroit who died young of cancer and the album, I think, reportedly is like was made out of a series of jam sessions. And, you know, it, it has this just great backstory to it. And you can just feel the energy. You can feel the light. You can feel her really working out wow. this like, yes, Afro harp jazz jam session. And I just it's something I put on when I'm feeling it's so comfort. It's so comforting. It's like comfort food to me. But it's something that I put on when I really need like a boost. Ooh, go to comfort food. My go-to comfort food, French fries, for sure. 100%. I eat Ugh. French fries like three times a day if I can. If I can, yeah. What's your if favorite kind of French fry, though? Mm, that's such a... Wow, that's a really hard question. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking of this place in Amsterdam, but I actually just went to one. There's another one in New York City um, in Greenwich Village. I'm forgetting the name. But I just love a whole, like when you can get the French fries in a cone and then you can yeah. have like the dress, like the toppings and dressings. And one of my favorite, it's, this is really weird, is peanut sauce and um, white onion. Yum. It's love so that. good. It's, I love that. And it just, but the, fa yeah, but that didn't answer your question. Maybe waffle fries, but I don't know. I like all of, I'm not, I don't discriminate except yeah. for the crinkle yeah. fries that we had at school. <laughs> I don't like those. There's a fry for every occasion. Wesley also made me like a spatchcock chicken last night, just like a classic chicken and like beans wow. and rice. Like that's also just like a go-to. Yeah, my partner yeah. is Puerto Rican and she's always just making like, yeah, she's always making autos con andules and like, you know, cuchifrito chicken. And like, that's also something I, I just associate. It's like mom's cooking too. There's just like every, so ugh, it's just a classic I'm so dish. hungry now. We both haven't eaten breakfast. We also didn't talk about us both being from the DMV. So what's your go-to food place in DC and favorite museum? God, I don't even know. It's been so long since I've been in DC, but I really, really miss um, eating like Ethiopian food in DC. I feel like that New York on U Street. 
Yeah, like we used to go out and then we would we would stop. I'm trying to remember the name of the places, but there's like one massive place that everybody goes and you know, we used to be out all night and then go there and then go home and and that was like oh, such a good memory. Growing up for me favorite museum, National Air and Space Museum, was my dad took me there most weekends because yes. it was free. But now it's the Blacksonian. Like I love I love 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 the National When you can get in. <laughs> when you can get in. I know I've been able to go like maybe three or four times, which is very lucky, but I can't wait That's to go amazing. back. It's one of my favorite places. Yeah. Is the Ethiopian spot Dukum? It, yeah. Dukum is definitely one of them, but I feel like there's a place, something kitchen and I, but Dukum definitely is, is one of the ones we used to go to for sure. We li- Adam and I, when we first got married, literally lived on 13th and you. Oh, and it was like probably if we didn't live here and we had to live somewhere outside of New York, that's where we would live again. Oh, how fun. A special. Okay. You were also a really big bath person and I'm a really mm-hmm. big bath person. I've taken mm-hmm. sometimes like three baths a day. So when you need a 10 out of 10 bath, what do you include in it? Oh my God. I love, um, oh wow, 10 out of 10 baths. So there's definitely going to be candles involved. Going to be playing really soft music on the Sonos, so it's like really surround soundy. Um, Epsom salts, but I really love um, this floral bath soak from Vertly, and I also love. I <laughs> I tend to order these Hinoki bath salts from Ten Thousand Waves, which is a spa in New Mexico, and I'll just order like fifty dollars worth. Just get like giant bags of these like Japanese pine scented salts. Like that's my favorite thing, and then I want the bath to be really hot, so when the salts go in, it just makes like aromatherapy in the whole space. Oh um, and then I love putting in like a little bit of CBD in the bath and like some coconut oil. So when I get out, my skin's really soft. That's like my favorite. I used to love putting herbs in my bath, but I clogged my tub. My girlfriend was like, please stop because I'm the one who has to snake the drain. So I don't do herbs in the tub anymore um, because I never scoop them out after. But I love like a really beautifully scented salt soak. Oh, so good. I'm going to be asking you for that the salt that you just mentioned okay from new mexico i got you (laughs) and Mm. i told you or i kind of you suggested i could ask you this so what's your deepest darkest secret oh wow yeah yeah (laughs) i mean right now in this moment the answer that's coming up for me is that you know i'm still i'm still so scared like there's so much i don't know like i'm still I'm still learning myself. Like I'm not finished, you know, and it's, it feels embarrassing to be like, I've lived life this long and I'm still not done cooking, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm still, I still have all of my childhood imprintings. I'm still so afraid of being rejected and abandoned and left behind. And Mm -hmm. I have to work on that every single day and it's easier every day, but it's lifelong, you know? And I, I think for a long time, I felt a lot of shame about still, having those impulses and and having to rework that wiring. But now I just see it as being, you know, very imperfectly perfect, you know? I love that. And Mm -hmm. I think inner child work is something that you can do at any point in your life. You can do it when you're 80 years old. I try to like help my grandmother do it. And I just think it's so important. And finally, Jenna, what Mm -hmm. do you know for sure? Oh my God. What do I know for sure? So in this incredible book called Revolutionary Mothering from 2016, edited by Alexis Pauling Gums, who is a brilliant academic, um, someone I'm I'm coming to know a little bit more intimately, but, you know, just a really incredible mind and thinker. And in this collection, she reprinted June Jordan's The Creative Spirit. And the book is about mothering, but it's also about how we reparent ourselves. Like you're talking about in our child work. A lot of that is to kind of, soothe the earliest version of ourselves that didn't always get what they need because our parents are imperfect people as well. They did their best, but they're not Mm -hmm. perfect beings. And so how do we reparent ourselves as a way to, you know, find that comfort within and and walk ourselves back to our truer self. But so there's this great quote from this essay called the creative spirit, which I think about, and it's, it goes, love is life force. I believe the creative spirit is nothing less than love made manifest. I see love as the essential nature of all that supports life. And love is opposed to the death of the dream. I think about that regularly. Like love is opposed to the death of the dream. And that's just the most radical orientation. (laughs) Um, I'm not there yet, but I want to be there. 
but you know it to be true. I know it to be so deeply true. It's like something that I've heard that like the minute I read it, I was like, that is Bible. That is fact. But I'm still walking towards embracing that in my life. But it, it reads, it's like as true as the sky is blue, you know, and that we need water. Like hydration is key. I'm like, love is life force. Yep. That's it. <laughs> yes. Jenna, I could talk to you probably for 17 hours. Just I 17 know. hours though. I Only know. This is so delightful. I love your mind. I love talking to you. I love talking to you about journalism too. I feel like there's going to be more of this in our future, whether we do it wow. for a pot or not. So I hope so. I'm so honored. Thank you so much for your time. Of I course. appreciate you. I have so much love and gratitude for you. Thank you for your interest. I was so delighted. This is so nice. I hope you enjoyed this storytelling session. For more Jenna Wartham, you can follow them on Instagram and Twitter at Jenny Deluxe and visit their website at JennyDeluxe.com. You can enjoy Black Futures by purchasing wherever you get your books. And of course, you can subscribe to her podcast, Still Processing. Please, please subscribe to Podcast Noir, rate and review. It is a great way to support and give me feedback. If you'd like to watch the video version of this podcast, it is up on YouTube or Facebook, both slash nor. And to you, our listener, I want to thank you for your listen and support. I'd love to stay connected. Here are some ways I'm telling stories these days. You can text me if you are in the US or Canada. Yes, it is me, not a bot. I also text you intentional daily questions of the day. My number is 301 246-8894. You can follow us on social, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube at Noor, and on Instagram at AYS. My Twitter, Snapchat, and Clubhouse is N Tagori. This podcast is produced by the At Your Service team, Adam and I. It is produced and edited by Molly McKean, and the amazing music is composed by Portugal the Man. See you next week.